at this point in the program, I'd like to welcome uh, Margie Graves. And I think uh, many of you are familiar with that name. Um, Margie is a um, very prominent figure in the federal IT community, and she's going to be moderating our first panel today. And I've had the pleasure of knowing Margie for a couple years. Uh, you may recall she was most recently the deputy federal CIO until her retirement from government service um, last December. And she spent a number of years at the Department of Homeland Security, where she was the deputy CIO. And in the early years of the agency, she worked um, tirelessly to help unify the IT architecture of 22 uh, separate legacy agencies. So uh, Margie, it's always great to see you. Uh, welcome. Hi, Megan. It's a pleasure to see you also. And welcome to all our participants this afternoon. I'll be moder moderating the conversation that we'll be having with our panel. But first, I wanted to start with a couple of teaser questions that will kind of uh, lay the groundwork for the discussion that we're going to have this afternoon. And you as participants, uh, please participate in the polling questions. Uh, the first one is, how do you define a hybrid cloud environment? A is at least one private cloud and at least one public cloud. B is two or more private clouds. C is two or more public clouds. D is all of the above. And E is it depends on who you ask. I'm sure, Margie, you have some strong opinions on this question. Yes. <laughs> but... uh, I think uh, you've seen over the years that uh, even though we defined uh, cloud through NIST at one point, uh, we actually um, have uh, conversations out in the in the universe now that still uh, don't exactly sync with that definition, and and many people think it uh, means different things. So I'm <laughs> interested to see what the poll says. So I'll give you guys about maybe ten more seconds for attendees to respond, and then we're going to pull up the results. And we have our our behind the scenes tech operator working tirelessly to uh, produce this event. So appreciate all that she's doing. All right, let's see if we have those results. Oh, interesting. So at least one private cloud and one public cloud. That's great because that means you're dealing between your on-prem uh, more highly secure environment and a uh, public cloud where you have partners probably with multiple vendors at any given time, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the larger agencies. Sure. And um, I think we've got one more polling question to tee up before we get started with your second panel here. And yes. Uh, what issues would you most like to learn about or hear about today as it relates to hybrid cloud? A is how cloud fits into an organization's IT modernization strategy. B, how cloud enables the adoption of emerging technologies such as AI and machine learning. C, security risk in this type of environment. And D, challenges in migrating apps and other functions to the cloud. And those are all really important issue areas. And I think we're going to touch on all of them today um, throughout the event, but curious to hear from our audience what, what they're most interested in. Maybe we'll give you guys about five more seconds to respond to the poll, and then we're going to see the results. OK, interesting. So it's a pretty close tie between security risk and challenges of actually migrating, particularly applications. And we found that in our discussions with federal agencies that uh, taking legacy apps to the cloud uh, requires a lot of prep and a lot of uh, understanding of your architecture and your data uh, before you can successfully do that. Um, so that is uh, not surprising to me at all. And the security risk, of course, we're going to have a second panel uh, because this is such a hot topic and you heard Grant speak about it earlier. It's such a hot topic, especially in the environment we're operating in today, that we're going to see um, a lot of discussion regarding security in these environments in the next panel. Great. Well, with that, Margie, I think I'm going to turn you over to the first panel, and uh, we look forward to that. And I think all of your panelists are here, which is great news. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good start. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> sure. Um, so with me today, I have Mr. Dan Jacobs, who's the lead for cloud adoption in IT modernization centers of excellence at GSA. 
And Dan has over 20 years of combined IT and cybersecurity experience at GSA and the COE that he supports. Uh, he supports modernization activities through adoption of enterprise wide security processes and technologies. So he's concentrating on the cyber side uh, right now. And I worked with, uh, with him also because he was a leader on many CIO council initiatives, including zero trust networking and the development of the CISO handbook. So welcome, Dan. Hi, Margie. Uh, Mr. Brian Merrick, who's the director of cloud program management at the Bureau of Information Resource Management at the Department of State. Boy, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Brian began his career, though, as a commissioned army officer and then worked for Price Waterhouse in the private sector before moving to the State Department. And he joined the Bureau of Information Resource Management and then has held roles in both finance and technology. In his current role, he's leader for adopting cloud technologies. Ms. Matab Mdabi, who's the Regional Sales Director for Federal at Dale Technologies. She's a federal business leader who delivers mission critical solutions to and emerging technologies to Homeland Security components. So she works a lot with my old agency, DHS, and she was also named a FCW Rising Star in 2019. Welcome. Mr. You. Mark Johnson, who's Group Vice President for Design Wins at Oracle North American Public Sector. And Mark was also an officer in the military for the Navy with 21 years uh, before joining Oracle, Oracle. And he was actually a fi fighter squadron leader. So a big risk taker there, aren't you, Mark? Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he's also an evangelist for hybrid cloud environments and using IT autom automation to secure and manage multi-cloud environments. So we'll talk a little about, about cloud orchestration today. So the, the first question is for you, Dan. Um, in your role at GSA, you've had a front row seat to the adoption of hybrid cloud environments, and you've seen it across the federal government, multi-agency. How have you seen the adoption progress over the last few years? And more importantly, what's facilitated that adoption? Oh, thanks, Margie. It's a, it's a big question, so you'll forgive me if I, uh, if I move a little fast. So it's, it's no secret that cloud adoption across the federal sector has seen year over year double digit percentage growth over the last decade. And it's expected to hit somewhere in the area of 10 billion annually in, in just the next couple of years. So it, it's clear that the adoption is happening at a rapid pace. But I, I think it's due to three primary factors, right? So one of them is it's easier to, than ever to buy cloud. Most, and I dare say every major uh, PaaS, SaaS, and IS vendor have clouds specifically for the federal government use, and they're all on GSA schedules. Uh, GSA and other acquisition centers are constantly adapting to the changing acquisition landscape, ensuring that agencies and ultimately taxpayers uh, receive the best value for their dollar. Um, not to toot GSA's uh, or my own horn here, but consider things like GSA paving the way for consumption-based cloud acquisition. Uh, these types of term terminology were, weren't even thought of three, four, five years ago. Uh, we have market research as a service. There's cloud migration templates and PWSs that are freely available for download, uh, enterprise infrastructure solutions. All of these things make it easier, faster, and cheaper to buy cloud. Um, as an example, GSA, a little known secret, GSA are our own customers. So we, as the centers of excellence, uh, we get no preferential treatment. We're, we're treated just like anyone else who buys. And my team just accomplished a buy that took 57 days from acquisition kickoff to contractor boots on the ground. That's not exactly Amazon marketplace easy, but it's certainly be uh, easier than say three, four, five, six years ago. Um, the second thing is standardization has made it easier than ever to make risk-based determinations for cloud services. So um, you know, I have a little bit of a cyber background myself. Um, ATOs have always been one of the biggest hurdles to cloud adoption, right? But now we have things like FedRAMP, which help you normalize the compliance landscape. And most recently, uh, the FedRAMP tailored, the, the low impact SaaS, which allows rapid adoption of solutions that are low risk and low cost for organizations. And shout out to my, uh, to my friend, Ashley Mahan and her team at GSA. Uh, another thing is we have the TIC 3, 3.0 reference architecture, which allows agencies to rapidly secure and scale uh, secure at scale, uh, cloud-based applications. And shout out to uh, Chris Connolly and his team at CISA for their thankless work. Those guys, great folks making great things happen. And we also have strong governance, which makes ATOs even faster. Consider things like OMB A130, 
which establishes ATO reciprocity, or, hey, let's share all the hard work we're doing. It's a novel concept. Other organizations could use our hard work, right? Um, NIST 837, which talks about ongoing authorizations, also known as continuous ATO, or, hey, we built this thing. We know exactly what's in it. Uh, we can update it automatically. Why do you say we stop wasting time trying to ensure that it's secure when we know it is and we built it? Um, the cybersecurity framework, which standardizes our approach to addressing cyber risk, and the list goes on and on. So because of these and probably a dozen other great security initiatives, risk determinations are becoming less of a let's figure out how to do something and more of a let's simply use what's already been done. And lastly, speaking of governance, um, I, I think uh, Mr. Schneider talked about this a little bit, clear governance and other cross government drivers make cloud adoption an easy choice. So things like Cloud Smart that Grant talked about, you know, defines how we see cloud, addresses security, procurement, and, and most importantly, uh, the uh, workforce management. And shout out to my great friends at the, the NIST NICE Working Group. Consider application uh, rationalization playbook, right? Six steps for uh, IT portfolio managers. Helps agencies make hard decisions of what to, what to keep when they're moving, right? It's almost like moving your home. What do I keep and what do I toss? Data center optimization, huge, unbelievable amounts of savings has come from data center optimization. Uh, acquisition reform, some of the things I talked about a little bit earlier. And I think of great um, importance are also my friends at OMB who, as Mr. Steiner said in his keynote, um, try to dance a delicate balance of policy focus between specific actions and intended goals. So take, for instance, uh, M1926, updating tick. It expressly says in the intent uh, that it's to remove barriers. I mean, that verbiage actually exists in the memo. So this leads the way to the reference architecture, which is kind of the embodiment of removing barriers to cloud adoption. So the list goes on and on on, on governance too, and it, but it, if you look at it in the totality, what it really begins to do is paint a picture of how much of a role strong governance plays in this space. And uh, that's uh, probably my time. Thanks very much, Dan. And I think it's it's really a testament to all the hard work that's gone on across the federal government, including working with all the agencies and getting their input on where their pain points were and understanding which policies we needed to change, how rapidly we needed to change, and which ones we needed to do first in order to prevent some of those blocks from uh, getting, you know, getting people uh, to the cloud. Um, so I really appreciate your, uh, your conversation with us today, uh, and I'm going to turn to Brian. Uh, and Brian, the State Department has a global and far-flung mission and has operations around the world. And in your role, you're embracing the cloud technologies to deliver on that mission. And can you tell us a little bit about the State Department's journey and what are some real life examples of where hybrid cloud environments have fit into that journey and how, how was the mission impact? Sure. So, you know, as you can imagine, uh, being a geographically uh, separate organization, uh, you know, with, we have 275 posts all around the world, uh, 47 different main mission areas. So uh, we have a multitude of function security uh, data classification levels. Um, different types of needs uh, all around the world. So, you know, what, what really happened is um, the business uh, drove the priorities based on their mission. And cloud came into play, especially for those programmatic areas that really need to take advantage of real-time processing, direct collaboration with our partners overseas, um, things that they needed to do that they couldn't go through their traditional networking processes. To, um, so prioritizing our resources and our efforts in terms of uh, supporting adoption and movement in the cloud for those business areas that, that have the most impact. Um, you know, so uh, for instance, you know, we're seeing a huge move uh, in terms of data capture, especially around uh, these COVID uh, related responses and issues. Um, all over the world, we very uh, uh, legacy approach to that in terms of uh, emailing questionnaires and, uh, and full text responses which you can imagine trying to collate that across multiple layers of organizations, which is uh, a mind numbing amount of manual labor. Uh, and so we, we were able to leverage uh, some SAS tools to actually uh, automate those data requests and those data calls, um, work with business partners across the agency to make sure that we knew who needed access um, and, and the approval processes for releasing that information. Um, you know, we were able to connect uh, that application to our master reference data table so we could ensure we had good clean data at point of entry. Um, 
you know, across the, the entire enterprise. And so um, what that's done is actually led to a whole relook at how we um, incorporate uh, best practices into uh, decision support processes and how we really look at data as an asset. And we're also able to connect back into a lot of our on-prem uh, data elements and connect that with some of the other survey data and, and new data captures we're getting around the world. And as you can imagine, um, an environment where you know we, we really can't access our network the way we used to, you know, sitting at our desk, uh, you know, our desktop, uh, you know, going through the traditional processes. Uh, you know, people need to be able to jump on their iPhone in an airport and report how many people just got on a plane, um, so they can figure out the repatriation logistics process on the back end back here. Um, and so by using cloud technology, um, you know, rendered for, for mobile accessibility um, with single sign-on through cloud-based authentication and role-based access uh, tools and processes, we've really been able to secure the environment and enable our users to, to access um, the tools they need to provide the information uh, for the decision makers at the right time uh, to make the calls they needed to. Uh, and that's something that uh, I think we're going to see more and more of that as time goes on. And so uh, in our respect, we're trying to stay tightly aligned with the, the business priorities across the agency, find those pieces where it benefits the most uh, from modernization, and really trying to surge on all the enabling pieces in terms of contracting, cloud platforms, single sign-on tools, and whatnot, so that we can assist in, in bringing those solutions uh, to the forefront. Oh, thank you, Brian. I think that sounds uh, like it's an incredible journey. And, and mostly, I'm hearing that you're taking some of the higher transaction volume um, uh, business processes that you have in the State Department, and you're taking those first uh, to the modern technologies, which will completely uh, deliver and give the impact to the agency that it's needed, and while at the same time staying secure. And so I want to move to Matab and Mark. You both work with multiple clients across the federal government, and how has the conversation with your clients changed, and what unique things are government doing with cloud and what's the best advice and counsel that you give your clients today? Matab, we'll start with you. Sure, yeah. The conversations have started to change and um, a big thank you for uh, getting that cloud smart policy out. It's, it's really been a game changer for us. So we're seeing the most savvy CIOs and uh, CTOs realizing that cloud is not a place it's an operating model and they're really driving their teams to create and execute a strategy for multi-cloud environments for their agency um, so we're excited about that i think that we do need to continue to drive the message i think a lot of the vernacular needs to change oftentimes i hear customers talk about on-prem um, on-prem isn't always a private cloud. And I think that we need to start to make sure that when we say on-prem, uh, if what we really mean is a private cloud that we use the right terminology, but um, we're very encouraged. Uh, some unique things that we're experiencing uh, that customers are using with cloud um, have been even with recent events with COVID-19. Um, customers are getting very smart about when and how to use public and private clouds. So COVID was something that no one was expecting. And I think we had, we were faced with the challenge of rapidly scaling out virtual desktop environments for a lot of our customers. And we work with many of them uh, to stand up VDI environments in AWS on the VMware cloud in AWS. And it was very fast um, and that's what they needed. They needed something fast and it, they thought it was something that was going to be mostly temporary, that they could shut down after a period of time. And now that we're realizing that this remote work thing is probably going to stick around even after COVID, um, we're more in a phase two of do it right. And since that workload has now become a persistent workload, uh, customers are realizing that the best TCO for persistent workloads are private clouds. So they're repatriating those uh, VDI environments back to their Adele private clouds. So um, it's exciting to see customers get smarter about workload placement. And my advice would be that no matter what you're doing with your different clouds, just don't lock yourself into any proprietary technology unless it's very unique and differentiated and only something that a single cloud provider can do. Um, for example, uh, 
I wouldn't recommend any customer leverage past solutions that are uh, provided by you know cloud vendors. Uh, I would I would tell you that those are strategically there to lock your applications into their cloud. Um, I would say instead, you know, invest in agnostic paths and container solutions uh, such as Pivotal Cloud Foundry or VM or Tanzu that you can really layer on any cloud that you want. Um, and not only future proofs that workload to be mobile, but it provides your organization flexibility and mobility. Um, on the flip side, if there's something that only one cloud provider can do, um, such as O365, by all means, go all in. Um, it's a great idea and, you know, again, it's very unique to them. I think my favorite quote to just remember, and I always tell customers, is just leverage the innovation and not the technology. You know, I do agree that I don't think we're ever going to go back to uh, the way it was before in an office environment or the way that we work in general. And you see it happening in commercial areas. You see it happening in conversations with the federal government as we're talking about bringing people back to work. That The definition of office is not going to be the same anymore. And there are going to be a lot more jobs uh, that are considered to be um, telework and remotely uh, available. Um, so I, I do believe that um, the key to that is, is the ability to scale and the ability to work in a secure environment at scale. And given the, the thoughts that you just gave us on portability and flexibility, uh, I know I was speaking with Jason Gray the other day and he said, uh, basically, um, you know, we'd like it to be agnostic. We'd like to be able to, to move work packages. And, uh, you know, that could be the wave of the future. So thank you for your comments. Uh, Mark, same question for you. What are you seeing in the conversations you're having with your clients and what's the best advice you're giving them and what are some of the unique things you see government doing with cloud? Yeah, thanks Margie. Uh, I think it's been great so far uh, from the keynote uh, to the speakers here. Uh, I think one of the things that's changed uh, in the last several years I've been doing that is the definition of why cloud. You know, I used to go in and say why cloud and they said well because my CIO told me I had to. Uh, you know, now it's gotten a much more sophisticated around the various workloads, which workloads makes more sense, which workloads can be brought to different types of clouds, back to the hybrid discussion. Uh, it's a rationalization of workloads like we talked about earlier, right? Dan was talking about this. Uh, what makes the most sense where? Uh, and I like the, really liked what Dan said about leveraging the work that's been done before. I think that's something we're not seeing enough of in government, and my advice to them would be this, is, you know, FedRAMP was built to take away the restrictions, like Dan was talking about, how do you make the tick easier? You know, I still see a lot of what I would call, for lack of any other term, the FISMA mentality in that my folks have to look at this. We have to do checking all these, whereas FedRAMP is supposed to be like, it's been checked, it's been another agency, or it's been the jab, they have provided all the paperwork for you. You don't have to go back and do this work for things that have already been done. You know, like Dan was saying, leverage what other people have done. But there will always be new workloads too. Matab gave a great story about, hey, you have to jump into something because of COVID-19. You need to experiment with new things. Even if it's not COVID, there will always be this desire to learn more. So it goes back to what Grant was saying about security of data. It's about securing the data. So think about if I just take a subset of my data and I mask it and it no longer means anything, can I go experiment with different clouds safely? Absolutely. I think that's a, a mentality that I'm seeing in some customers, but not enough to go out and learn what new innovation is there because there are always and always will be new creation of new services and technologies that can mean a lot to government and its constituents. So take data that doesn't matter to anyone that's been masked, it's real valid data, and go experiment with some of these new things before you need to go through all the workload of doing an ATO. Then once you know how you would use that service and what you would use it for, then you can say, okay, this doesn't exist anymore, but it's good for my agency, we're gonna do this. And now I put my people to the, that effort which is more valuable. And once it gets done, of course, everyone else can leverage it and see the value of what you've done. So 
that's the kind of discussions I'm having with customers now and the, some of the advice I'm giving them on ways to look at new services and use this hybrid environment of bring the workload to the right place at the right time. Well, thanks, Mark. I think uh, one of the thoughts that you brought forward was um, the innovation and the ability to uh, take a risk and, ha and, and uh, pursue those experiments and being able to work at the data layer because working at the data layer is going to be the key to security in more and more open environments as we go forward. And, you know, I would say today, uh, a lot of your data is out there. And uh, you need to be able to understand that uh, if we can encrypt and work at the data layer and, and uh, monitor what is going on with that data, we're going to be much better off. Um, these environments are no longer castle and moat, um, multi-layer, secured. Um, it's more software-defined networks. It's more, uh, you know, internet as transport. So uh, we're going to be operating in those environments as, as we go into the future. And one of the discussions um, that we're having today is how we're going to secure it. Uh, that's going to be very tricky, but in actuality, it's going to be forced upon us because we're going to have to operate that way. So we need to figure out what the uh, true answers are at this point and then move out very smartly. So I have a next set of questions uh, for all the panelists. Um, in creating these cloud environments, you know it's never easy to do this transition. So what have you observed as the key factors to success or the cautionary tales, sort of the do's or don'ts? And we'll start with Brian. Yeah, so <laughs> there's a, quite a few of those. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think to start with, I mean, part of the, the, the challenge is really making sure that all the people involved understand the, the fundamental uh, differences in the mechanics of how these environments work. And even between different clouds, uh, you know, SAS, PaaS, and IaaS all function very differently, and even different providers within those operate very differently. Um, there's only a couple of cloud uh, solutions that operate fairly closely to the legacy com counterparts, so it's, it's very rare. Uh, we see this as a, a huge issue when we engage a lot of our, our business customers in terms of um, making sure they fully understand the implications of, of how these things work. Uh, so they can take advantage of the functionality and the possibilities and the systems, um, but then also realize what changes need to be made, you know, to the application layer itself and the data layer. Um, it, it, it really, I can't underscore that enough. Uh, going to eyes wide open is, is critical. Um, also, uh, quite frankly, there has to be, especially at the SaaS and PaaS layer, uh, when you're talking about applications, it, there has to be a uh, uh, room to update the processes and, and the way uh, the business units actually operate. Um, what we see is so it's, oftentimes folks want to come in and just lift and shift their existing processes and make it look exactly like what they had before, but different. And, you know, part of the value in these tools is you're, you're buying a lot of that already baked into the code. So you're really just configuring it. They end up spending a lot of time uh, sometimes choosing the wrong tool and then trying to back into that, um, that change averse uh, stance, if you will, and, and you really lose the benefit, you increase the cost of customization and the challenge in stabilizing security in that environment if you over customize a SaaS or a PaaS offering. Really critical to do that. Um, also, um, you know, quite frankly, what we found is the security operates uh, oftentimes in a much more granular or optimal way in the cloud versus what we can ever do on prem. The amount of uh, uh, research and development that goes into this on the cloud providers uh, behalfs, we could never match that uh, with our traditional uh, security uh, resources that we have in our network centric models. So um, that's something that you also have to understand how the security piece works and making sure you have a good strategy for authentication and role based access is crucial. Um, you know, we've moved toward and started the movement uh, in uh, very quickly into a cloud based uh, authentication tool that will provide a single layer of authentication across both our internal and external customers. Um, one thing that, that we've noticed was a, a real discriminator in terms of uh, our business units choices to go into the cloud was the ease of, of uh, providing resources to our external partners and external user community that access our data for specific mission related business needs. Um, as you can imagine, trying to do that in a, a traditional network environment just really isn't feasible. So, um, knowing really who that user base is that, that you're targeting with your application layer work is, is critical to make sure that you've got the, those controls built in. 
um, and you've got the right approach in terms of who is going to say, yes, it's okay for this individual to have access to that environment. Um, and what level of, of rigor are you going to put into that, that process? Uh, and then certainly as you kind of work back into the, the, the layers of detail, you also want to think about um, what data is going to be used in this from the standpoint of data becoming really truly an asset. So once I've captured this data or I have residual data downstream from a workflow process, what are the other uses that might uh, come from this data and start connecting the dots with other business uh, data consumers to see how um, we, can, we can actually look at uh, reusing that data, sharing that data, not just for analytics, but also to avoid duplicate data entry uh, and, and to make sure that we avoid uh, things like reconciliation errors between different data sets and whatnot. So that there are a lot of second and third order effects that, that become possible when you leave that traditional kind of, you know, uh, line and box model of a system and data set uh, and start looking at how the different pieces of um, cloud-based application uh, services kind of connect together and allow you to, to more seamlessly share data uh, between those activities. So, you know, those are just some of the, the main things, but, but even at a, a larger uh, level, cannot underestimate uh, the, the, the amount of change management that re you really need to think about yeah. uh, through the entire process yeah. and not just from the user perspective. I mean, you know, certainly when you're talking about collaboration tools and, and SaaS stuff, there's a degree of that, but what you got to think about um, how this changes your, your contracting models, your contracting folks need to understand it, budget folks as you move to a, a consumption-based cost model for services, government doesn't budget that way, so you have to have very good uh, kind of tactics around how to manage that. Um, need to think about how the, the back-end environments need to change and making sure the networking security professionals understand in depth, you know, what you're trying to do. Because th this whole thing triggers a lot of second order effects. So when we talk about things like say, um, a hybrid data share between say a SaaS tool and, a, and a, um, an on-prem or a private cloud data set, well, there's a whole host of changes that need to be enabled uh, at the network level and the security level to make that work safely and, and repeatably. And so thinking through those processes and getting those stakeholders comfortable with the change is, is really critical, or you will have just made this great solution that now you can't access the data to run it. Um, and, and, you know, with that, it, it, it drives a lot of downstream policy changes. And certainly, um, you know, you have to be open to adjusting risk tolerance also, uh, certainly more senior levels, because that's going to drive a lot of, you know, you, you have that interplay of, hey, I can do all this great stuff really, really fast. Because like in that, you know, some of the examples I was talking about, you know, we rolled out 10 applications in two weeks um, that service the whole department. That's never been done before like that at that kind of scale and speed. Um, and the cloud made that possible, but it wouldn't have been possible without um, having the right stakeholders in place, understanding risk tolerance and making adjustments based on exigent circumstances, knowing your security and, and how to empower that and really understanding uh, you know, what, what the priorities were for the organization. All those other things kind of have to be brought into this discussion as you start talking about modernization and taking advantage of these capabilities kind of drive you into a change management paradigm. Um, I think the key though is to look at it is trying to get to not getting to where you're done changing, but getting to where you're done making big changes and you make small changes all the time. And that just makes it a lot easier. You really have to change that, that change paradigm, if you will. Right. The incremental uh, approach uh, always seems to give you a little bit of uh, the uh, try something. Uh, if it fails, fail fast and then move forward. Uh, the emphasis on understanding your data and your current architecture and knowing how those interact together and being able to address each one of those in turn and understand how you uh, mesh them in order to to go to the next um, set of technologies is, is critical. And finally, you know, I, I really liked your comment about the fact that um, you can't, you have to rethink the way that you actually deliver your mission processes and you don't form fit it to the technology or try to customize the technology to fit it. You really have to rethink um, the way that you deliver your services and then understand how you would apply the technologies to it. So Dan, you want to add to that? Uh, sure, uh, it's it's a tough act to follow. Thank you for inviting Brian. So now it's it's very difficult for me to uh, make anything <laughs> interesting anymore. Um, That's okay. You can you can just riff off of that, and then uh, you can make it a little shorter. That's fine. <laughs> uh, 
So, sounds great. Well, the, the Centers of Excellence have been uh, fortunate to work with nearly a dozen federal agencies. I've personally been on four engagements. And um, what I've seen is, is that what works at one agency uh, doesn't necessarily work at another. Uh, it could be shot down in a second. So, so let me just start with what I personally believe is probably the single most important success factor in cloud transition. And I'll say it very slowly, strong executive leadership. Strong leaders empower their organizations to make credible, risk-informed decisions which drives business outcomes. Forward-leaning CIOs like Maria Rowe and Dave Scheib, um, they're, they're known for a reason. They're masters at the things of like what, what Brian was talking about, you know, the fail fast, fail forward. Strong leaders tend to have a plan. Uh, they have it documented, they have it communicated, and most importantly, they've had it picked apart by their business units. Uh, this, of course, means things like business case and alternatives analyses. It also means that they have a dogged commitment to modernization. I mean, look, Margie, as you know, this is hard work. It takes a lot of resolve to see these types of things done. So I, I want to amplify, again, what, what Brian said previously. Successful executives understand that success is an eyes wide open exercise. They prepare the battle space and then they execute with excellence. And one last consideration, and, and, and I'll, I'll wrap this up. Uh, in large agencies, a centralized cloud management office located under the CIO can be a force multiplier for adoption. Consider some of these ideas, and these, are, these might be experiences that I've, I've actually seen. Being located under the CIO, there's a close integration with the C-suite. So adoption of large scale solutions, for example, AI ML solutions, which are really more data than code, they're more easily facilitated because they're handled at the C-suite, vice trying to matriculate upwards. Uh, Fatara requirements, much more easily satisfied with a centralized environment. Uh, security can be integrated as an organizational imperative, vice a patchwork of independent capability specific tools. Does this, any of this sound familiar? I've lived this life. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> right. Uh, centralized control of enterprise IT assets is almost always easier, and cloud solutions are no different. For instance, if we take a look at the rapid embrace of DevSecOps and AIMLOps pipe, uh, pipeline solutions, um, these things are driving innovation across the federal space. They're all cloud-based, right? Uh, the Centers of Excellence has helped two organizations so far work through what a centralized DevSecOps as a service and an AIMLOps as a service for their own organizations would look like. It's this kind of forward thinking that can enable the entire organization to develop secure, innovative solutions rapidly and immediately experience value. Uh, I think this is part of the TCO conversation that, that, that we had earlier. So I, I think one, the strong leadership drives the other, which is this idea that because we have uh, a clear understanding of what we have on the ground. We understand our brick and mortar. Now we're going to start moving some of this stuff into the cloud and many of our new solutions are going to be cloud-based. We're going to start building our applications through DevSecOps and AI MLOps pipelines in the cloud space. Strong leadership uh, with this centralized unified control really helps. There are some downsides and I, I don't want to get too far into it, take up a bunch of time, but um, for large organizations, that's a very strong uh, value proposition, I think. Thanks. Yeah. So the buy-in and the leadership uh, carrying the flag and understanding what modernization can mean to the mission, understanding the art of the possible, and then supporting uh, both the mission leaders and the technologists to be able to actually deliver on that promise is, is absolutely critical. I know Brian talked about change management. It's usually not the technology, it's usually the human beings. And uh, we have to understand that that's a huge part of the equation. You've seen it in COVID-19 and the way we flipped the switch very quickly and, and people adapted. Uh, there are some that adapted better than others. And that cultural change occurred because it was necessity. And we had to do it overnight. So those are the kinds of things that are driven by the mission imperative. And when you see these kinds of big moves to the cloud, uh, you can absolutely uh, count on, on some cultural uh, divides uh, occurring, but eventually uh, people recognize the, the value and, and being able to move forward. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mark uh, to add anything further. Yeah, thanks, uh, Margie. I, you know, I liked what you said about the cultural change and the rapid cultural change. We can do it when we need to, but it comes back to 
what Dan was talking about as far as risk informed. It can't be risk avoidance. You know, if you want to be successful with this transition, you make at the appropriate level the right risk decisions. And uh, a lot of times the appropriate level, it's not always, you know, the head of the agency, it can't always be, right? As Brian was talking about, there's different integration requirements, networking, security requirements. Everyone on the team needs to have this mindset of how are we going to make this happen? Not like, why can we not make this happen? You know, it's like when it, when it happened overnight, like you were just talking about Margie, everybody leaned into it and guess what? It got it done in most cases. Yeah. You know, so that's the, I can do it. I got to figure out how I'm going to do it securely and reliably versus the, Oh no, you know, hang on. This is, you know, too much risk. I can't do this. So take the right risk from the top down, drive that mentality. That's a good, strong, you know, success factor for these transitions. Big don't, I would say is not, you know, to try to think I'm just going to take what I have and move into the cloud. Again, back to what Brian was saying, I'm going to make this fit my processes. Nothing's going to change here. You know, uh, sometimes there are better ways of doing things. You know, we need to adopt those and think about that as we look at where we're going to go. And sometimes we have customized what we have so much that it works. It works specifically for the needs of government because they're unique to anything else in the world. And so, okay, maybe we can find a better, more efficient way to do that. But sometimes it's also, especially back office, HR, financials, move to a SaaS product, you know, change those products, go to something SaaS, and then move the really core mission things to an infrastructure. And you're looking for a way to connect all those, again, back to the hybrid cloud kind of story. So, you know, the don't is don't just move what you've got. Exactly. Um, there's such a huge opportunity to be able to completely reimagine the services and to have those enabled by technology. And uh, people have to be visionary enough to do that. And that's where the leadership comes in. And then everybody just lines up in sequence and has their particular role to play. Uh, so, Matab, you want to add some last thoughts on this one? Sure. Um, again, I agree with everything that the rest of the panelists have said. I'll add a few things to it. Um, some do's and don'ts. And I think that I'm in a very unique position because I get to see across many agencies and I can also see internally at what Dell did um, in moving to the cloud and what worked and what didn't. So um, I'll start with a few don'ts. Uh, don't patch up your legacy on-prem data center and try to turn that into a private cloud. You really can't take the stuff that you have and turn it into the stuff that you want. Um, I see customers trying to do that by adding automation to their legacy on-prem, and really all you're doing is automating the problem. So that's a big deal. Um, another big deal, uh, don't really rely on SaaS for everything. I think that a lot of our agencies are starting with SaaS as their first option, but there comes a point where if you are having to customize that SaaS tool over 20% to meet the requirements, yeah. it's probably not the right fit. Um, so I think that we really need to be intentional about when we use SaaS um, versus other cloud technologies. Um, my last don't, uh, again, just again, don't think about cloud as a place, it's an operating model and you really need to make sure that you have options and make sure you know that even in a private cloud, there are so many different cost modelings um, that OEMs can provide, you know, flexible, consumption-based, um, subscription-based, uh, partners like Vion in the ecosystem have done this for a long time. Uh, you can do OpEx with private clouds. Um, you just have to write, you know, the right contracts and you can do managed service with a private cloud. Those all exist. Um, some do's. I think application rationalization is amazing. Um, I think one other way to look at it is leverage events um, such as an ELA renewal or the requirement for a net new application or an application going end of support life or needing an upgrade as a catalyst to move and change it and go to the right cloud solution. 
And when those events happen, uh, you really need to kind of identify six different branches of that workload. You look at it from a workload perspective. And again, you either decide to repurchase it, and that's a SaaS capability. You rewrite it, a PaaS capability, replatform it, containerize strategy, rehost it, which is IaaS, you retain it, IaaS, or you retire it. And I think that what IT needs to be really good at is catching those six branches and determining the right landing zone for it, whether it be SaaS, private, public, hybrid. And just think of two questions, you know, where do I run work? Where do I store data? And when you really go through that, again, does the data live on a Navy ship? Is it mobile? Is it at your edge? you'll start to really land on the appropriate landing zone. So um, IT has to be smart about catching those six R's or we call them branches. And you really know when it's working uh, in a customer, when you stop seeing sole source AWS contracts and you start seeing more IDIQs for IaaS um, that have both public and private, you know, awardees on it that give you options so that you can, you're not, you know, just limited to a single, single solution. So we keep coming back to the theme of, of the flexibility, the portability, and also understanding um, your own roadmap and, and how you want uh, your mission to evolve as it's enabled by technology. Choosing the right, um, even portfolios of systems. I know when I was at DHS, um, there were several systems that worked together and included systems that were at the State Department and DOJ, uh, where they worked together in common business practices and understanding how, how that uh, operates and then being able to uh, modernize accordingly uh, for the entirety of the end-to-end -end business process is important. And it's not one size fits all. Some no, of it will be in public cloud, some of it will be on-prem, some of it will, the data will be one place and we'll have to operate between the two. And, and that really leads us to our last question. And, and uh, we may have covered some of this territory already, so it'll probably be, um, you know, a little bit shorter discussion than we originally anticipated because we've, we've talked um, about a couple of the uh, complexities. But, you know, as federal agencies operate in, in these multi-cloud environments, um, the ecosystems do become more complex. They're harder to manage, both from an operations and a security point of view. So how have your agencies or your clients managed that complexity? So things like cloud orchestration or things of that nature, what are the best practices that you've observed? And, you know, Matosis, we're with you. We'll start with you. Yeah, and again, just going back to the last question, the customers that I have to give shout outs to are Stuart McGuigan at State Department and EAD Rich Haley at FBI. They're, they're putting all these things into action. So I just wanted to make sure I included that. Um, to answer your question, I really have to go back to my initial remarks. You really have to look at standardized cloud agnostic solutions. Um, I'll give you an example. Pretty self-serving for me, but there are others. Uh, <laughs> Here at Dell, we provide the Dell Technologies Cloud, and we have that with an on-prem solution, but we have that exact same solution and software stack in AWS, in Azure, Group, and Oracle is going to be GA here, Mark, I think, you know, in the next couple quarters. Um, and what that allows our customers to do is have a multi-cloud ecosystem, but have standardized services be able to have ops teams that are standardized on similar technologies. And that really eliminates a need to have an AWS op team, a Google ops team, an Azure ops team, a private cloud ops team. As much as you can standardize and leverage cloud agnostic uh, services, I think that really brings the complexity down. Mark, can you add? Sorry, stuck on mute there for a second. So I do think that, uh, one of the ways I agree that you know it's try to to standardize on particular operating models, but I also think the biggest way probably to hand off complexity is to go to a SaaS model, right? Where you've handed all the complexity of managing the application 
the uh, data, the infrastructure, everything to the cloud provider can greatly simplify everything, including even much of the security, right? There's still always gonna be things for the end users to do, but that's gonna be the most simple operating model you can have. Uh, you know, and then as you scale down gracefully from there, depending on what the workload is, like we talked about before, you know, you try to kind of give away as much complexity as you can and keep things, only keep things when you have to actually operate that portion of it. Um, for security, I think it all comes down to data is at the core, right? We've talked about that and it's talking about choosing a cloud uh, that's got encryption all the way across, you know, so that even if you're breached, your data is encrypted. Uh, then you have the infrastructure is secured, and, you know, then you have, you, you move out to the application and eventually the users and you have security built in at all the layers because it's no longer like you were saying, Margie, it's not just a fortress out there. We just keep people out. Uh, you know, the assumption has to be that there's a zero trust environment. Uh, which is the way modern Gen 2 clouds are built. It's what uh, Oracle has built for their, you know, our cloud and how we provide it to customers. So that's the way we think of security. Dan? Hey, so from an operations perspective, uh, I mentioned in the last question that centralized cloud management is, or can be at least a force multiplier. Um, let me riff on that a little bit based on uh, some of the things that I've I just heard from, from Matab and Mark, who frankly articulated it much better than I could. So centralized approaches to multi-cloud environments are optimal, right? Because they provide that standardization that Matab was talking about. And also, as, as Mark mentioned, if they decide that one of the ways to reduce that complexity is to simply give it away and move with a SaaS model, uh, it's that centralized ability and, it's the C-suite that makes those decisions so they, so they can do that. Uh, but if they decide to keep some of those, all right, uh, a centralized approach is, is easier from a product um, or easy to produce uh, relevant governance, right? So all the governance, the strong governance we were talking about earlier is provided by, uh, embedded by the C-suite. So say for instance, a simple question, uh, is the data security lake, which is owned by the CISO, or is it owned by the CDO? It seems like a simple question, but it's not really a simple answer, especially when you start getting into it. And where is the, where are those answers written? Um, what governance specifically address, addresses security products like Zero Trust that has capabilities which are amplified by using what's traditionally considered non-security data? Um, one of the elements of a, a, a very mature Zero Trust implementation is using some HR data to understand where our, where our folks are coming from and what they're doing. Uh, so that data does not live in a data security lake. It, it might live in a, in a data lake, but it's not the data security lake. And the CISO does not own that. So where, do the, where does that integration come into? That's where centralization comes into play. Uh, it's, it's also easier to affect and ensure proper oversight. For instance, multiple business lines using the same forms. Um, this might have actually happened in the federal government once or twice. Um, multiple business lines within one agency use the exact same forms to accomplish different things, different lines of business were doing it. And they, they weren't sharing. In fact, they didn't even know that they were doing it. So how much longer would it take to herd those kittens versus a single executive with budgetary authority, say for instance, maybe a COO, um, making a strategic decision to consolidate those two lines of effort. Um, the, the acquisition piece that Matab was talking about earlier, centralization helps ins ensure the most efficient use of funds. It becomes a business decision. It's not just a security decision. It's not just a data decision. It's a business decision, right? And, and lastly, I'll, I'll just wrap up this piece with a, a word of caution. It's not all roses out there, right? A uh, centralized approach is great for small and medium-sized organizations, but there is danger in large organizations. It can make business units less accountable. For example, I might have been in an organization at one point in history uh, that had what we would call a 1.0 implementation uh, that saw all their business units thrown into a centralized bucket. Uh, and it seemed like that was the way to go. We only have one bill, we only have one this and one that. Um, and it wasn't a problem until one misconfigured process single-handedly burned 26% of the annual dev budget in one weekend. Then all of a sudden it became an organizationally wide major impact. So um, 2.0 leverages or like the, the, the cloud 2.0 and, and the evolution of our, of our uh, management products allow us better software, better solutions, vendors are doing a fantastic job, but 
the question I would bring is management software is not the sole solution. It has to be com combined with a solid governance model, billing integration, and other things, considerations, in order to reduce some of the problems in large-scale organizations. It's not just simply, hey, this is web scale. Let's go with it and move forward until, again, you, you burn 26% of your dev budget because of one rogue process, no value added. Yeah. So, Brian, uh, if you could bring us home, and then we'll move to questions with Megan. Yeah, so uh, kind of going to that centralization, decentralization, what should you do? Yes. <laughs> so the way we've addressed it, it really with our entire strategy is to say, look, um, we want to provide centralized, managed, centrally managed uh, platforms and access to those. But in terms of satisfying your business need, that needs to be managed at the location closer to where those business decisions are being made. So if there are back office processes that are managed back at, at headquarters, the headquarters should be deciding that. Um, if there are uh, management processes that are basically um, decision powers in the field, they need the power to decide that. Um, and so we're trying to align our, our technology uh, approach with that. Um, so that way we don't have to try to, to manage uh, change over 30 different bureaus trying to use the same tool to do kind of the same thing but different. Instead, we're saying, look, why don't uh, you come on our platform? We'll take care of all the nitty gritty IT stuff. You focus on your business process, your configuration, your user community, and talking to your customers and making sure you're meeting your business objectives. Um, and oh, by the way, if you can do that in our SaaS platform and our boundary, you're not going to need an ATO because it'll be covered within ours. Um, and so we're really trying to take a smarter look to how we kind of um, make those divisions based on, on uh, decision points and not so much just a, a technology backend. Uh, to that earlier point quickly about uh, automation, yes, automation is critical and it's key. It really doesn't work optimally in, in terms of you know, one pane of glass on everything. There are still native tool pieces that, that happen better in those distinct environments. Um, that being said, there are other things that you can aggregate like security monitoring, CASB activity, um, and certainly access controls. Um, but some of the, the nitty-gritty things like orchestration need to need to happen in, in uh, organic uh, tool sets, native tool sets. It really just depends on what it is. Um, and that's something we're continuing to mature as we go down the journey. Um, and, you know, I think industry will continue to come up with better solutions to optimize that environment. But, but automation is critical in making sure you have good delivery. Thank you. Uh, and Megan, I think you probably have been monitoring the universe there and uh, seeing if there are any questions that could be asked? Yeah, I think there was one good question that came up from the audience and I don't know that all the panelists need to address it since we're getting a little bit tight on time, but the, but the question is, you know, there's been discussion about how agencies are moving systems and workloads from on-premise to cloud environments and what kind of special considerations um, should be given as agencies, you know, launch these new mission services or new capabilities on cloud platforms. There's a couple thoughts on that. That would be great. Okay. Can someone uh, volunteer? Okay, Dan? Application rationalization. What is that capability and does it really need to go? Do you really need to have it? And does someone else actually do it better? That's a nice, short, succinct answer. I like that. Um, so Marge, you guys have just a couple minutes left, so I'll leave it to you to uh, wrap it up then. Okay. Well, thank you to our panelists today. Um, uh, let's do a real round robin, just quick 30 seconds. What would you like the takeaway to be uh, for the audience today? And Dan, since you were up, we'll start with you. Okay, 30 seconds. Um, three key areas for successful cloud adoption. One, remove the barriers to, to the adoption itself. Two, accelerate risk determinations, and three, increase the efficiency. That is, lower the TCO while increasing service delivery. I think there's governance that supports most of that. Seek that governance, and uh, I think you'll be well on your way. Great. Brian? Uh, I'd say understand uh, the culture you're working in. Uh, definitely understand the problems that your customers are trying to solve, and make sure they understand the art of the possible as well. And, and you know, thread that needle between the art of the possible and, uh, and the constraints that you have uh, to try to marry that to an optimal solution uh, going forward. And I think that's going to be one of the, the key things that you cannot underestimate uh, the impact of culture and people on adoption of technology. Mark? Yeah, to Brian's point, it's all about getting people to say, tell me how 
you know, use the right level of risk. Tell me how we're going to do this because we're going to do it. Not, don't tell me no. Leverage what's been done before. Take the FedRAMP solutions, you know, use what people have done. And don't be afraid to, you know, experiment with new stuff. Kind of to the last question, take, you know, go use new services, stand up new capabilities in cloud with dummy data, you know, so that you can experiment and determine how does it apply to my agency. And that's a, a valuable way to get started. And Matab, final thought. Try to be really quick. Um, I would say don't over rotate on anything. Like just make sure that you uh, have options. Uh, I think a lot of our customers are over rotating on SaaS. And if we're all using ServiceNow or Salesforce for everything, what's the difference between different organizations? Um, I would also say that in order to be cloud smart, you have to, again, app rationalize, or we call it, though, look at the workloads from those six branches. And after that, it comes down to two questions. Where do I want work and where do I store data? And lastly, I go back to it, leverage the innovation, not the technology. Don't get locked into proprietary technology unless it's unique and differentiated and leverage agnostic services and layer them across your ecosystem for mobility and ease of your operations. Thank you so much to our panelists today. And Megan, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Well, thanks again to our panel. And thanks to you, Margie. It was great having you here today and hope you can maybe stay for the rest of the conversation.